A reading from Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall cont contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light, he shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. This is the story of Jesus' love for us, according to St. John. Remember that last night we shared the story of Jesus eating supper with his friends. In that story, he showed how much he loved them by washing their feet. Well, before he did that, his friend Judas got up and left. He decided that he was going to betray Jesus, hand him over to the authorities who wanted to kill him. I wonder why Judas wanted to do that. Maybe he wasn't happy with the way things were going, or maybe he was disappointed because Jesus wasn't the kind of leader Judas wanted him to be. In any case, that's what he did. He decided to hand Jesus over to the authorities for 30 pieces of silver. After Jesus and his disciples finished dinner, they went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus went there to pray. And after praying, a large crowd showed up. And who should be at the front of it but Judas? Judas thought Jesus didn't know what he was doing, and so he had arranged for a signal to the people he was with so they would know which person to arrest. And Judas decided this signal should be something 
that would be ordinary, expected, so that Jesus wouldn't suspect anything was up, so that Jesus would never know that it was Judas who had betrayed him. <clears throat> and so Jesus, excuse me, Judas, saw Jesus there. And he reached out his arms and he said, Rabbi, and he went up and he kissed Jesus on the cheek. That was the sign. Is that what a kiss is for? Well, the soldiers and everybody with Judas, they went to arrest Jesus. They came with clubs and spears and swords. Jesus said, do I look dangerous? Is that why you've come with an army to arrest me? Who are you looking for? He asked them. They said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. Now when they heard I am, they all fell to the ground. Does that sound strange to you? All these heavily armed people with clubs and spears and swords falling down when Jesus speaks? It sounds strange to me. But I remember that when God first told Moses what God's name was, that's what God said. I am who I am. That's what Jesus said to those guards. And that name, I am, made them fall to the ground. Well, they got back up, and Jesus asked them again, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. <clears throat> and by this time, Peter was feeling brave. And he pulled out a sword, and he struck one of them, a man on the ear. That man had a name. His name was Malchus. He had a family. He had people who cared about him. He had people who wanted him to make it home safely at night. Peter didn't see that. He saw somebody who was part of a crowd who was trying to arrest his friend. And in that moment, Maybe he hated Malchus. Maybe he was afraid of him. But he lashed out in violence and anger. But remember what Jesus said last night. Remember what he told his disciples? He said, you should love one another as I have loved you. And so, while Peter lashed out with a sword, Jesus reached out with his hand. He told Peter, that's enough. This is not the time or the place for violence. And he took his hand, and he put it on Malchus' ear, and he healed him. One of the people who was there to arrest him Jesus healed him. Just like his friends, Jesus loved Malchus to the end. <clears throat> well then, the crowd that was with Judas and Malchus arrested Jesus. They tied him up and led him away. And where do you think Jesus' friends were in all of this? They got scared. They ran away. Maybe you think that sounds like something they shouldn't have done. But can you imagine how you might feel if a bunch of people armed with club, uh, clubs and spears and swords 
came and arrested someone you love, wouldn't you be scared? I would be. I think maybe I might have run away too. Well, that crowd who arrested Jesus, they took him to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, Caiaphas was the man who said that it's better for one person to die so that the nation might live. Caiaphas was afraid of Rome. He hated the Romans. The Romans were people who came and took what wasn't theirs, who wanted to rule the whole world, wanted to run things their way, and they violently stopped anyone who resisted them. Caiaphas was afraid of the Romans. He was afraid that if Jesus stirred up trouble, that the Romans might start a war. Isn't that what we do sometimes? When we are scared, like Caiaphas, when we're angry, we look for somebody to blame, don't we? We look for somebody who can be the problem for us, or something. Then if we can solve just that one problem, then we think maybe all of our problems will go away. But it doesn't usually work like that, does it? They took Jesus to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. And Peter, Peter tagged along. He came and he waited outside Caiaphas' house while they interrogated Jesus inside. There were a bunch of people in the courtyard standing around a fire warming themselves, and Peter went and stood with them, hoping that maybe Maybe he could overhear something, or maybe he could be there if Jesus needed him. But somebody recognized him, though. They asked, weren't you one of Jesus' disciples? Peter was trying to keep a low profile, probably. He said, no, not me. Somebody else said, surely you're one of them. No, he says, I don't know the man. Well, inside the house, they questioned Jesus. They didn't like his answers, and so they beat him and spit on him, did lots of other unkind things to Jesus. But Jesus kept answering their questions, and he said, Have I answered anything wrong? If I have, testify to the wrong. Tell me what's wrong, and I'll see if I can't fix it. But if I haven't done anything wrong, why are you doing this to me? I wonder if Jesus could have used Peter's help. I wonder if Peter could have helped. But he was still out there in the courtyard. And then somebody else said, You must be one of Jesus' disciples. You're a Galilean just like him. And and Peter said, listen, I told you twice already. I don't know the man. In that moment, a rooster crowed. That's what roosters do sometimes, right? They crow. But when that rooster crowed, Peter remembered something. He remembered what Jesus had said to him after supper. Jesus had told him, before the rooster crows three times, before the rooster crows, you will deny that you even know me three times. Of course, Peter hadn't believed it. He said, 
Even if I have to die for you, I will never deny you. But here when this rooster crowed, Peter remembered what Jesus had said. And he left, and he wept bitterly. That's one thing to weep. It's another thing to weep bitterly. Have you ever wept bitterly? I know I have. To weep bitterly, you have to feel really, really bad. It's one of the worst feelings in the world. I wonder what Peter was feeling in that moment, why he wept bitterly. Well, after this trial, the high priest sent Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor. Pilate didn't want anything to do with Jesus. He tried to send him back, but they wouldn't take him. So he brought Jesus into the headquarters and he asked him, are you a king? He was trying to find out, you see, if Jesus was going to lead a rebellion against Rome, if he was going to start a war that Pilate and the Romans would have to fight. If he was, Pilate wanted to stop him before he started. But Jesus didn't have the answer that Pilate was looking for. It's a simple question, right? Yes or no, are you a king? But the answer was more complex than Pilate realized. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was, you'd be right. My followers would start a war and they would fight and they would try and free me, but my kingdom isn't the kind of kingdom you're thinking of. Pilate, he thought he had him, he said, aha, so you are a king. And Jesus said, look, King is your word, not mine. I have one job to do. I was born for one reason and one reason only, to testify to the truth. Pilate was a cynical man. He knew that whoever has the most power gets to define what the truth is. And so he asked Jesus, which truth are you here to testify to? Pilate next brought Jesus outside to the crowds. He knew that the chief priests didn't like Jesus, that they were trying to get him arrested. But he also knew that the crowds loved Jesus. He was popular. He thought, maybe if I take him out there, they will let me they will want him want me to release him. Because you see, Pilate had a custom. This was the Passover, one of the great big holidays of the year. And every year at the Passover, Pilate would release one prisoner for the people. He thought, maybe if I take Jesus out here, they will want me to release him. And then the chief priests won't have anything that they can do. So he brought Jesus out to the crowd and he said, who would you have me release for you? Your king? Do you know what the people said? They said, we want Barabbas. Barabbas was a bandit. He was a person who took things that weren't his, who used violence to get what he wants. That's the kind of people that we like, isn't it? People who use violence to get what they want. We want people who will help us get what isn't ours sometimes. Well, Pilate took Jesus back inside. Because 
The charge against Jesus was that he was a king. Pilate figured he'd dress him up like a king, gave him a fancy purple robe, even gave him a crown to wear. This wasn't the kind of crown that you might think. It was a crown made of thorns. This crown is made from blackberry brambles. You ever poked yourself on a blackberry? Has it ever gotten caught in your pant leg and scratched you? It hurts a lot, doesn't it? I wonder what it would feel like to have a crown like this forced down on your head. Jesus, or Pilate took Jesus in this purple robe and this crown of thorns and brought him back out to the crowd. And he said, what would you have me do with your king? And they said, crucify him. Now, crucifying is a very nasty way to die. Your hands are nailed to a cross like this, and you hang until you can't breathe anymore, and then you suffocate. It was a punishment reserved only for the worst of the worst. The Romans crucified people to make examples of them, to warn others not to do what they had done. I wonder why those people wanted to crucify Jesus. They must have been very angry at him. Well, Pilate wondered that too, and he said, why? Why should I crucify him? What has he done? And they answered him, he pretended to be God's son. He pretended to be God's son. When they thought that Jesus was God's son, I wonder what they wanted him to do, what they thought that meant. Maybe they thought he was going to ride into town on a white horse and kick out the Romans. Maybe they thought he was going to be a king. But he didn't do that. I wonder if that made them mad or disappointed. Well, when Pilate heard that Jesus had pretended to be God's son, he got afraid. He brought Jesus back inside and he said, where did you say you were from? But Jesus didn't answer him. Well, then Pilate, he got kind of huffy. He said, hey, you, I'm talking to you, he said. Don't you know who I am? I have the power to give you life or death. I could crucify you if I wanted to. And Jesus says, you may have power, but whatever power you have was given to you by my father. When Pilate heard that, he worked even harder to try to get Jesus released. He took Jesus back out to the crowd one more time and he said, here is your king. And you know what that crowd said? We have no king but the emperor. Remember how those people felt about the Romans? How much they hated them? how much they were afraid of them. I wonder why they had to say that. I wonder why they tried to make Pilate happy by saying they had no king but the emperor. I wonder if they were angry that Jesus couldn't save them the way they wanted to be saved. I wonder who they really thought would save them. Pilate 
went out to a place called Gabbatha, the stone pavement, where everybody could see him. And he issued the sentence. Jesus would be crucified. So they took him to a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. And there they crucified him. They nailed him to that cross with two other people on crosses on either side of him, on the left and the right. And Pilate put an inscription on the cross over Jesus' head. It said, Jesus Christ, excuse me, it said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. But even then, the Jewish authorities weren't happy. They went up to Pilate and they said, that's, your inscription is wrong. It should say he pretended to be the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, it's already written. I wonder if he knew that what he had written was true. When they put Jesus on the cross, they stripped him of all of his clothes. And the guards who were there, they divided up the clothes because it's a shame that good clothes should go to waste. And they divided everything evenly except for that there was one piece left over, a tunic. It was woven in one piece from the bottom. It was a really nice tunic. And they didn't want to cut it, and so they decided to cast lots for it, to throw some dice and see who won. St. John said that was to fulfill a scripture that said, they will cast lots for my clothing. So Jesus has been nailed to the cross. I wonder what that felt like. I wonder what was going through his mind. While he was up there, he saw the people who were there. Uh, Some were jeering and spitting at him. Some were mocking and insulting him. Some were crying for him. And there among those people, he saw one of his friends, his best friend, the disciple whom he loved, John. And he saw his mother, Mary, they must have both looked oh so sad. They stood there crying for Jesus, and even in that moment, Jesus' heart was filled with love for them. He looked at his mother and he said, Woman, here is your son. He pointed at John. He looked at John and he said, here is your mother, pointed at Mary. It seems like even in that moment, Jesus didn't want two people that he loved to be alone. By now, Jesus and the others had been up there for a while and Jesus said, I'm thirsty. And so they ran and they got some wine and dipped a sponge in it, put it on a stick and held it up for him to drink. And when he had drunk, he said one more thing. He said, it is finished. I wonder what he meant by that. What was finished? Was it his life? His life was finished? Was it the work he came to do? I don't know. Maybe it was both of those things. Maybe it was something else. After he said that, he died. Now, crucifixion can take a long time to kill a person. People could be up there for hours or even days. 
But the next day was the day of preparation for the Passover. And so Pilate ordered the guards to go break the legs of the people on the crosses. And they broke the legs of the person on the right, and they broke the legs of the person on the left. But when they came to Jesus to break his legs, they saw that he was already dead. So they didn't break his legs. And John remembered that in Psalm 22, it says, not one of his bones shall be broken. But the guards wanted to make sure that he was really dead. And so they took a spear and they pierced him in the side. And when they pierced his side, blood and water poured out. Blood and water. Those seem like things that we've heard before, haven't they? That blood, it's a little like the blood of Jesus that we share at communion, isn't it? And the water, that's a little bit like the water that's in our baptismal font. I wonder if that means something. Well, that day, one of Jesus' friends, Joseph of Arimathea, came and asked Pilate if he could have Jesus' body. He wanted to bury it. And Pilate gave it to him. Now, when you bury a body, you wrap it up in a white cloth. And you wrap it up with a bunch of spices so it'll smell nice. It's one of those things that maybe doesn't make a lot of sense to us, but it's kind of what, like one last nice thing you can do for somebody. One last way that you can show them you love them after they die. But it wasn't just Joseph of Arimathea who showed up. Somebody else came too. His name was Nicodemus. Nicodemus was one of those Jewish authorities, one of those Pharisees who didn't like Jesus. Nicodemus had come to Jesus first at night and asked him some questions, and we were never really sure if he believed what Jesus told him or not. But he showed up today. And he brought some spices for Jesus' burial to wrap in that pole that Joseph had brought. But he didn't just bring some spices. He brought a hundred pounds of spices. Now, I don't know any more about Jewish burial customs than you do, but I know that a hundred pounds is a lot of spices. Such an abundance of spices makes me think of some other stories of abundance. It makes me think of Jesus' first sign at the wedding in Cana when he turned the water into wine. He created so much wine that it would have taken days to drink. It also makes me think of that time in Bethany at the dinner party when Mary came out with a very expensive bottle of perfume a new bottle, and she broke it open and she poured all of that perfume all over Jesus' feet. Perfume, you know, only takes a little drop. One drop will do. But she used the whole bottle, and the house was filled with the fragrance. I wonder if all of that spices that Nicodemus brought, if that meant something. Well, they took the spices that Nicodemus brought and the cloth that Joseph brought, and they wrapped Jesus' body up in it, and they took it to a tomb and laid it in there. That tomb was in a garden. There was another story that happened in the garden, wasn't there? 
a story you all know. It's a story about a man and a woman who lived in that garden. They were made there. That was the very first story, wasn't it? The whole story of God's people began in that garden. And now our story tonight ends in a garden. But it's not really the ending, is it? It's not the ending, but it is an ending. We'll find out tomorrow what happens next.
Jesus said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. We pray now for all people drawn together by Christ into the one family of God. Let us pray, brothers and sisters, for the Holy Church throughout the world. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all the nations in Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, guide the church and gather it throughout the world. Help it to persevere in faith, to proclaim your name and to bring the good news of salvation in Christ to all people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for Elizabeth and Richard, our bishops, for Francis, the bishop in Rome, and the head of the Catholic Church, for Bartholomew, the bishop of Constantinople, the head of the Orthodox Church, for Ponti, the president of the Lutheran World Federation, and for all rostered leaders and servants of the Church, and for all the people of God. Almighty and eternal God, your spirit guides the church and makes it holy. Strengthen and uphold our bishops and pastors, rostered leaders and lay leaders. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the church and help each of us in our various vocations to do faithfully the work to which you have called us. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those preparing for baptism. Almighty and eternal God, you continue to bless the church. Increase the faith and understanding of those preparing for baptism and give them birth as your children. Almighty and eternal God, you continue to bless the church. Increase the faith and understanding of those preparing for baptism. Give them new birth as your children, and keep them in the faith and communion of your holy church. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our sisters and brothers who share our faith in Christ. Almighty and eternal God, you give your church unity. Look with favor on all who follow Jesus, your Son. Make all the baptized one in the fullness of faith and keep us united in the fellowship of love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God. Almighty and eternal God, long ago you gave your promise to Abraham and your teaching to Moses. Hear our prayers that the people you called and elected as your own may receive the fulfillment of the covenant's promises. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, gather into your embrace all those who call out to you under different names. Bring an end to interreligious strife and make us more powerful witnesses of the love made known to us in your Son. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not believe in God. Almighty and eternal God, you created humanity so that all may long to know you and find peace in you. Grant that all may experience your love and grace through the lives of your servants throughout the world. 
and come to know you as the one true God. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all God's creation. Almighty and eternal God, you are the creator of a magnificent universe. Hold all the worlds in the arms of your care and bring all things to fulfillment in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for Kit our mayor, for Jay, our governor, for Joseph, our president, for Patty, Maria, and Derek, our congresspersons, and for all those who serve in public office. Almighty and eternal God, you are the champion of the poor and oppressed. In your goodness, give wisdom to those in authority so that all people may enjoy justice, peace, and freedom and share in the goodness of your creation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all those in need. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to travelers, free those unjustly deprived of liberty, and deliver your world from falsehood, hunger, and disease. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Finally, let us pray for all those things for which our Lord would have us ask. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>